Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to Metropolis Radio. Today, we are going to be looking at the sequel to Mad Max, The Road Warrior. Now, if you're in the United States, this movie released as The Road Warrior, but for my international listeners, this was simply just Mad Max 2. Now, with this movie having a bigger budget than the first movie, how does it stack up against it? Does this movie fall into the trap that every other sequel does where it just can't recapture the essence that the first movie brought, or does it elevate, even supersede the first movie? Now, before we get started, make sure to follow the blog, metropolisradio.blogspot.com, where you can stay up to date on all Metropolis Radio uploads, no matter if they're exclusive to YouTube, BitChute, Library, whatever platform you're currently watching this on. So with that out of the way, let's get right into Mad Max 2 or The Road Warrior. Now, as always, we always start off these retrospectives with the creative team, and this movie was directed by George Miller. His other directing credits include the segment Nightmare at 20,000 Feet for the Twilight Zone movie that was released in the mid-80s, the segment obviously being a remake of the classic episode of the television series that starred William Shatner, uh, Lorenzo's Oil, The Witches of Eastwick, Babe Pig in the City, Happy Feet, and Happy Feet 2. Now let's move on to the writers, and we'll start with the man himself, George Miller. His writing credits include all of the Mad Max movies and all other movies I listed under his directing credits, with the exception of the Twilight Zone movie. He also wrote a TV miniseries called Bodyline, and he wrote the first Babe movie. Now let's get to Terry Hayes. Now, he was one of the co-writers for this movie. His other writing credits include the theatrical cut of Payback with Mel Gibson, Vertical Limit with Chris O'Donnell, and From Hell with Johnny Depp. And finally, we have Brian Hannett, and he was the other co-writer for this movie. Now, his writing credits include movies such as The Time Guardian and Flashpoint. Now, those movies are ones that you've probably never heard of, unless if you're in Australia. Uh, And for my Australian listeners, I apologize, I am not familiar with either of these movies. Now, there's one big element about this movie that I really want to touch on, and that's just for people in the United States, and that's the name change. Uh, This movie was originally supposed to be released in the United States at the same time as it did in Australia. That was December 24th, 1981. The original distributor, American International Pictures, was in the final stage of a change of ownership at the time, so the movie wasn't released in the States on time. Warner Brothers decided to release the movie here, but they had the name changed to The Road Warrior. Now, why was the name changed? Simply because the first Mad Max movie wasn't popular in North America, despite it becoming popular as a result of being shown on cable channels at the time. In the marketing campaign for this movie, Warner deliberately distanced this movie from the first one, even though the original title was Mad Max 2. When the when this movie released, people began to speculate that this was a sequel to Mad Max because of the opening prologue showing archival footage from the first movie. And as a result of that speculation, uh, Vestron Video, a, uh, a, ver- uh, a very well-known pioneer in the home video market in the 80s, decided to re-release the first Mad Max movie on video and subtitled it at the time with The Thrilling Predecessor to the Road Warrior. Now, if you're listening to this and you're not from the United States, that's why this movie is referred to as The Road Warrior, whereas the rest of the world got it as Mad Max 2. Now let's move on to the character analysis portion of this, and we always start with Mel Gibson as Max. Now in this movie, instead of being a man who's losing his sanity as the world comes crashing down, he's now a mythological figure. The beginning of the movie opens with a narration basically iterating, This is the story of the Road Warrior. I said in my Mad Max retrospective that Mel Gibson is playing a man with no name character, but has a name. But in, but in the first movie, he isn't the man with no name because he doesn't stroll into town, solve the problem, and then vanish just as mysteriously as he arrived. Well, in this movie, he does just that. Max has now genuinely become the man with no name character archetype that was popularized in the 60s with Clint Eastwood and the Man With No Name trilogy. That's the Fistful of Dollars, Few Dollars More, and Good, Bad, and Ugly. Now, now just like the first movie, the other characters are really here to service the plot. Max is the same type of character that reacts to the plot instead of servicing the plot, and that's fine given that the filmmakers need to now build up Max as a mythological figure and not just a man losing his sanity and then snapping when his wife and son get murdered. There's an old saying, you can't pull the cart before the horse. Now let's move on to our narrative analysis portion of this, and this movie opens with that narration that basically goes over the events of the first movie that got Max to where he is coming into the beginning of this movie, 
It's also mentioned at the beginning that this movie is taking place in a world with an oil shortage, and that leads me to believe that the first two movies in this series, it's Mad Max and The Road Warrior, are a reflection of the oil crisis of the 1970s. Now, Max is being chased by gangsters and then comes across a gyrocopter. The pilot jumps out, takes him hostage. Max quickly gets free, and the pilot basically tells him about a town that is just pumping all the gas from the ground and refining it. Max goes there and scopes out the town for about a day. He then rescues a guy who's been shot by an arrow and is promised all the gas he can carry as long as he gets him back to the town. The man dies, and, and so does the deal that Max made with him. Here's where the man with no name has to come and save the town. The antagonist for the movie, known as Humongous, comes by and threatens the townspeople with, basically, you've got two days to leave everything behind, or else we'll slaughter you and take everything anyway. Max works with the townspeople to grab the truck that he passed in the beginning of the movie so they can load up the oil and get out of the town. In exchange for this, he gets his interceptor back along with all the gas that the interceptor can carry. Now, there's a conflict when they try to bring back the truck and some of the townspeople get shot in the process. Max leaves with his interceptor only to be ambushed and have the interceptor blown up on him. Now, if we're looking at this as a hero's journey, this is the low point of the hero. He gets rescued by the gyrocopter pilot and brought back. And that's when Max agrees to drive the oil tanker, and that leads to the famous car chase sequence at the end of the movie. And just to sell this as a mythological tale, the movie ends with the revelation that the feral kid who can't speak a word of English is the narrator for this movie. He says that he's never seen the Road Warrior again in his lifetime, that he only exists in my memories. Now let's take a look at the reception that this movie had. Now this movie has a Rotten Tomatoes score of 93% that's based on 45 critic reviews and an audience score of 86% based on 84,471 audience reviews. Now this movie on Metacritic has a score of 77 based on 15 critic reviews and a user score of 8.5 out of 10 based on 182 ratings. And this movie is sitting on IMDb at 7.6 out of 10 based on 162,708 reviews. And this movie had an estimated budget of $3 million, and that was 10 times the budget of the first movie. And this movie grows $36 million worldwide. Now, adjusted for inflation, 1982 numbers to 2020, that is a worldwide gross of $96,172,974.09. Now, this movie was, at the time, a critical hit, with many citing it as an improvement over the first movie. Many critics have put this movie as one of, if not the best movie of 1981, I adjusted the box office totals for 1982 numbers, and that's because the United States didn't see this movie until May of 1982. Now, many Mad Max fans consider this movie to be the peak of the series, and I would agree with this point, but I don't want to get too far ahead here. And I'll just simply end the episode off with this. This is one of those rare cases where the sequel is actually superior to the first movie. I understand that the first movie was made on a smaller budget and the filmmakers probably had to adjust to compensate for it. The biggest reason why The Road Warrior is superior to the first movie is because instead of a story about a man who's losing his sanity as society breaks down and cracks, this movie focuses on making Max a mythological hero. The idea of Max being the Road Warrior wasn't in the first movie. He was a good cop, but he wasn't the Road Warrior. This movie really shows that George Miller wanted these Mad Max movies to mimic westerns. As I brought up before, Max has the man with no name archetype, and instead of horses like a western, there's cars and motorcycles.